So, um, yeah, it's just a lot of the time when you start at IS, you get all these different business units and you never understand the foundations. So it doesn't fit together properly. And I was saying earlier, that's probably why I didn't do too well at Varsity because uh, I've stuffed around in first year and then the rest as well. So that's, <laughs> that didn't help. But not having the foundations right is never great. So this is to get the foundation. Some of you might have been trained by some of the business units already, so somewhat too late. But uh, maybe the stuff will start making sense going forward. Also, what it's not, it's not a hardcore technical training. So some of the stuff I actually don't know, and I just make it up as I go along. Um, and it's just my understanding of how some things work. A lot of it, also, you don't need to know when you're speaking to clients, but it's nice to know some of the background stuff about how it all kind of fits together. And it just helps you think going forward. So it's kind of a training for going forward. Um, and yeah, it's interactive. So ask me any questions, go wild, um, just have a chat. Uh, so yeah, the first thing I want to ask someone, anyone, except for those who know already. It's better when someone doesn't know. A one-line definition of the internet. Anyone want to give me a one-line definition of the internet? Yeah. Okay, you can be filmed, so let's get you on. <laughs> one, line <defi> one line definition of the internet. What do you, what's the internet to you? If someone said, what is the internet? Just give like a one-liner. What is, what is it? A network of people connected via electronic wires. That's a great definition. Anyone else want to give a definition? Anyone? Anyone feeling brave enough to give a definition? Okay, I've heard a lot of definitions in the past. I've heard um, it's the place where all the information in the world is kept. I've heard it's the place where you email. I've heard it's like the biggest library in the world. Um, I've heard it's where, you look, where all the websites are kept. Um, I've heard a whole bunch of really weird things. But basically, my one-line definition of the Internet is the interconnectivity of people around the world. So your definition is great. It's all these people connecting via technology. Um, so it really means that the computer in your office is connected to your friend in the UK, is connected to someone in the US, it's connected to a website in Singapore. All of these things are connected. So the network is the way that all of these things connect. Things like email are what you do now that you're connected. Things like websites are what you can do now that this road is connected. So the analogy that I always like to use is the road system. It's an actual road system getting from point A to point B, and you can go there a whole bunch of different routes. If you want to drive and visit friends, you use your car on the road. If you want to shop, you use your car on the road. If you want to, whatever you want to do, you use the road system to get there. Okay, so that's, uh, so the internet is actually the road. And if you've seen those signs, I think we've got a couple of pictures up. It says the information superhighway. And I think the information superhighway is probably one of the best definitions of the internet for me, because it's the best analogy of what the internet is. Okay, so now the internet's all about these roads. Okay, and on top of that, you can do a whole bunch of things on top of the roads. So you can build shops, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, So anyone know how the internet started? Anyone know? Easy stuff? Bretsky, you know. Okay, so initially it was really, initially it was really um, a bunch of uh, guys sitting in, in an office saying, well, we, we need to swap information from one computer to the other, and they used to have those floppy drives which are about this big, and to pull that out and put it into another machine, it's a waste of time. So you need to connect the two up and let them start talking to each other. So, so two computers started talking, a whole bunch of computers around started to talk. So if you've got one computer, another one, put it together, the third one connects and start putting it together, fourth one connects and start putting them together, fifth one connects and start kind of wiring them all together. That's obviously a fairly inefficient way of, of building a network because this guy needs three different connections to connect to three different people. So a better way of doing that is to set up a central point and you connect those central points up to a central point. Okay. So initially we started connecting computers and when a computer is in a small area and all connected we call it a LAN. Local area network, pretty easy. Okay, you all know what lands are. Um, and then as you start building a point and someone else builds a point like that, so we can start connecting those points up to each other. Instead of doing the same inefficient route as that, we shouldn't connect the big points together. We should have a central point where all of these points start connecting to. Okay? So you always try to get a central point. And for me, that looks like a web. So it's the World Wide Web, you know, the whole World Wide Web. It starts looking like a spider web. And as you start taking a local area network and you start taking it more than 50 kilometers, whatever the definition is, away, and you connect two of them up, it becomes a wide area network. So a WAN. So you might have heard of WANs, wide area network. Pretty easy stuff. Okay, so that's a LAN and a WAN and how things started getting connected up to each other and how the Internet generally starts to build up. So 
all you need if you're sitting at home and you want to go to Eastgate or Northgate to shop, I'm taking all the gates because of my surname probably. Yeah. Let's think of a different one. If you want to go to Sandton to shop, um, you don't have to build a road to Sandton. All you need is a driveway to get out of your house onto the road. From that road, you take another road, take another road, and the roads get bigger, and then maybe get smaller again until you get there. But you just need to get connected to that road system. So if you can connect into a point like that or a point like that, you are connected to this internet. Okay. And you can get anywhere and do anything you want to. So um, when IS first started, all we needed to do was connect up to that uh, to that big network. So let me rub all of that out. Let me see what I was going to talk about next. Okay, so let's talk about the IS network. So a network can be drawn as a line or as a cloud, other way around. Okay, and IS built themselves a network. And what we did was we connected up to the international internet. So we connected up to one of those little central points. International internet. And then what we did was we started connecting clients onto our network. Okay. So all we needed to do was connect to a really, really cool point internationally. And then people could get it wherever they wanted. We just had to build one decent road, one big highway that people get connected to, and then they can get anywhere else in the world. So we were reliant. Initially, we used to connect to the U.S., and we were reliant on the U.S. connecting us to the rest of the world. Okay? In South Africa, other ISPs developed. So we've got another ISP, and they would connect up to this international internet. Okay? And they might have had a client or two, not as many as us. And if our client wanted to talk to their client, Theoretically, they go all the way overseas and back down to, to that user. So they were connected. So in South Africa, that's like saying, okay, I live in Joburg. This guy lives in Pretoria. Let's drive to meet each other. And you have to drive all the way overseas through this massive highway and back from overseas on this highway. It's doable. It's possible because in the Internet world, we do have highways. In the, in the real world, we don't have this massive highway to the States, but in the Internet world, we do. Um, so you can drive that way, but it's pretty inefficient. So again, with that network design, we, des we put a central point in South Africa called a peering point. And we said ISPs can connect up to that peering point. So I is connected to it, and a couple of other service providers connected to that peering point. Okay. The peering point in South Africa, we've got two of them that I know of. One is called Jinx, Johannesburg Internet Exchange, and it's in our Rosebank offices. The other one's called Sinx, Cape Town Internet Exchange, and I think it's also in our offices in Cape Town. But it's just a virtual point. So now all ISPs can connect up to there, and you don't have to drive all the way overseas and back. Okay, it reminds me of that joke. Uh, all of our international links remind me of that, that, uh, the guy who rubs a genie vase, and uh, genie pops out and says, okay, I grant you one wish. So he says, um, I, wanna, I, I like Mauritius, and I like, I like to go on holiday there, so build a highway from here to Mauritius. And the genie goes, geez, you know how difficult that is? That's concrete cement in the, in, the, in the sea under the ocean. It can get washed away and have to stabilize it. And it's thousands of k's of tar. And so that's too much of a mission. We wish something else. He goes, okay, um, I want to understand how a woman's mind works. So the genie looks, okay, so this highway, two lanes in both directions, a garage. So, so that's essentially what we've done. We built these big highways overseas. Okay, we built massive, and a satellite is a massive highway that goes overseas. Satellite connects up in the sky and comes back down, and then you get fiber links. And our fiber links called SAT for some silly reason, bad acronym, and can we connect via fiber. So that's like a tunnel going underseas to another country. Um, so we've got satellite and fiber connections that, uh, that go overseas. And those are our bandwidth costs. Our, our local lines and road system that we built, as well as our international road system that we built, these big bridges in the sky, as well as the tunnels under the sea. Those are like biggest expense at ICE. They're more than all of our salaries put together, except for Brett's. <laughs> so it's all of our salaries put together are not our biggest cost at ICE. It's our bandwidth. It's our biggest cost. This is a huge, and that's what we invest in, is, is that, uh, is that massive, those massive highways and roads. So, um, yeah, so that's how we get connected to the international internet. At the moment, we've got connections to the UK and to the US. Um, we've got satellite and fiber connections going all over the place. And the access business unit will be able to tell you and keep you updated as to the latest connectivity and how much connections, we've, how, much, how big our connection sizes are, et cetera. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's, about, that's basically how we all get connected. Obviously, IS drawn as a cloud there. We also have different branches around the country. So that might be Cape Town as a branch, and then Cape Town would then offer connectivity to a client. So a client buys 
predominantly the first thing that we ever sold was connectivity. They connect into us and we connect them into this, um, this highway. Actually, IS was started by buying band bandwidth from UUNet. We used to buy bandwidth from them. I think it was UUNet at the time, was I Africa at the time, whatever it was. We used to buy bandwidth from them. We were a second tier service provider until we grew big enough. And we broke away from them, bought our own international bandwidth, bought, built our own international highways. Okay. So let's talk about what we actually sell them. We sell leased lines a lot of the time. And give me an example of a leased line. What size or whatever? 64K, right. 64K. What's the rest of the abbreviation? So what did you say? Kilo? Kilobytes per second. Okay, that's wrong. Okay, it's kilobits per second. So let's have a look at what that means. A lot of the time we're selling 64 kilobits per second, but what does it actually mean? Let's break it down. 64 means 64, not rocket science. Easiest part of the question. Kilo, what does kilo mean? Thousand. Okay, so it's times a thousand. Bits, what is a bit? Eight bytes is a bit. Anyone else want to tell me what a bit is? Anyone? Everyone agree that that's right? No? Yes, yes, no. Okay, a bit, let's talk about a bit. A B is a bit, okay, and it is either a zero or a one, okay. A capital B is a byte, and it's a collective term for eight bits. So when you've got eight bits together, it's called a byte, okay, so it's the other way around. So a zero or one. So what's relevant about a zero or one? Does anyone know what the numbering system is called when you use zeros and ones? Binary. What's the number system that we use in everyday life? Yeah, numeric. What's the numeric system that we use? Anyone? Decimal, that's right. Okay, so we use decimal. And in decimal, how many numbers do we have in decimal? Ten. What are they? Zero is a number. So we've got, in decimal, we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then we run out of numbers. We've got no more numbers left, so we decide to start again. So we put a 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. Should be familiar. <laughs> okay. Binary, we've only got a 0 and a 1. So we start with 0, and we go 1. Okay. And then we've run out of numbers already, because there's only two numbers. So we start again. So we go 1. Zero, one, one. One, zero, zero. One, zero, one. One, one, zero. One, one, one. One, zero, zero, zero. So, and so it carries on. And I got an email today that says um, um, there are only 10 people in the universe. There are, only, there are only 10 different types of people in the universe. Those that understand binary and those that don't. Okay, because 10 is 2. Okay, so in binary, that is 2. So there's only two types of people. Okay, those are so hopefully you understand a little bit about binary. So binary has only got two numbers, and we count with those two numbers all the way. Why, why is this important? What, what, what could you possibly know about, gain about this? The first thing is that everything that we do on, the, on computers and internet, everything works with zeros and ones. Absolutely everything works in zeros and ones. Okay. So all the information that we send, we don't send letters. We send zeros and ones on the internet. Things are either on or off. Why do we use binary to send information? It's simpler. Simpler is a good dish word. Um, simpler is not bad. Um, machine language, that's an average answer. <laughs> I'll, give you an ex I'll, I'll tell you why we did it. It's for accuracy. Okay. If you think about Morse code, Morse code is dots and dashes. There's no dot, medium dot, long dot, dash, long dash. Because you might get confused. Was that a dot or a dash? Or like a, so if you've only got dots and dashes, you know it was either a dot or a dash. Same thing with binary. Either it's on or it's off. There's no discrepancy between the two. And if things get slightly distorted along the way, you, will, you should be able to tell whether it was 0 or 1. So if you're talking on a microphone, for instance, and the sound kind of does that, and it's got to go through some type of filter, and it comes out again, it might look a little bit kind of like that. So it'll be a little bit distorted, but it'll be around about what it was originally. In computer terms, if you have around about what it was originally, your document's not going to look the same. So what we do is we only send zeros and ones. So we say that's one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. And if it gets a little bit distorted, it might look a bit like that. 
But if you kind of have a line in the middle, you say, well, that was definitely a 1, that was definitely a 0, that was a 1, that was a 0, 1, 0. So you can, re when information comes to you, you can tell that was a 0 or a 1. Even if it's got a little bit of noise in it, you say, well, that was a 0. And if, it's got, uh, if it sounds like a 1, it's most likely a 1. So you lose very little information. It's the most accurate way of sending information using only two different options. Um, there's a big problem with it, though. In the past, I could have said to you, Four. Now I have to go one, zero, zero. I have to send you three bits of information, whereas in the past I just sent you one bit of information. What it means is that we need to be faster. So everything on the internet needs to be fast. Okay. Switching equipment, when you talk about how expensive it is, it's because those things send zeros and ones through them so fast. Routers, why are they so expensive? What speed is my router? Um, what speed switches and LAN and WAN do you have? It's all about those zeros and ones going through. Okay. So we've got to push zeros and ones through. So we take a Word document, break it down into zeros and ones, and we send those zeros and ones up and down the line. Okay, so everything's in zeros and ones. So we can send zero or a one per second. So what that's saying is we can send 64,000 zeros and ones down a 64 kilobit per second line in one second. Okay, that means if there was a, a copy or one of those lines that counts cars that go over it, if you look at how many cars can go over it, if the line's perfectly utilized, you'll count 64,000 zeros or ones in one second. Okay, they'll go past you. The first thing about um, this line is it's bi-directional. Bi-direction, both directions. It means 64,000 can go in the one direction at the same time as 64,000 come in the other direction. So when we sell clients a 64K line, we could have sold them a 128K line and said, well, that's if we add both sides together. All right. <laughs> okay. But it's 64,000 bits in one second going the other direction. Anyone know what speed those zeros and ones are traveling down that line? Speed of light. Correct. So everything on the internet also works at the speed of light. I had an argument the other day about if it's actually the speed of light or not. In a vacuum, it's the speed of light. Blah, blah, blah. It's there or thereabouts. It's basically the speed of light. Everything travels at the speed of light. Okay, so the zeros and ones are traveling the speed of light. So if you think about it as a, um, as a road again, because I like roads, it means that there's cars, 64,000 cars can travel down this road in, past a point in one second. And every car is traveling at the best speed possible. So hypothetically, every car is traveling at 120 k's an hour, 120 kilometers an hour. No can go faster, none can go slower. They can be back-to-back, -back, means it's 64,000 a second. If there's some gaps in it, that means the line's not perfectly utilized. Um, so you might not get as many through, but that road is able to handle 64,000 of them in a second. What happens if you need more cars to go down that road? What do you do? You increase the bandwidth. In, in other words, you put extra lanes in. Okay, put more lanes into that road. Um, if you can't make if you can, can't make the car go faster than 120 k's an hour, and in this instance we're talking about speed of light, so we can't make those zeros and ones go any faster. We need to have more lanes. More lanes is bandwidth. Okay, so when a client says to you, "My line's too slow." You shouldn't say to him, you idiot, it's not. It's going at the speed of light. But in your head, you should think, that line's not too slow. It's going at the speed of light. That's the fastest we can travel. That's the fastest zeros and ones can travel. Your line's not too slow. It's too narrow. Okay. So we need to make, give it more bandwidth. Okay, so that's what bandwidth is. Cool. Is this all making sense? Is anyone bored yet? Everyone happy? Okay. Very nice of you. Tough audience. <laughs> um, all right, so that's what... Uh, speed, and that's what an internet line is. It's what a 64K line is. It's a 64 kilobit per second. All right. Um, so if we carry on in the binary thing over here, we can see that. Ooh, anyone want to get that? No worries. So um, in binary, what happens is when we get, if you have a look at how many digits can represent numbers, one digit can represent up to two different numbers. It can represent a zero and a one. If we use two digits, we can represent up to four numbers, 0, 1, 2, and 3. If we use three digits, we can represent eight numbers, okay, all the way to seven. And so it carries on. If we have four digits, four digits can represent up to 16 numbers. Okay, Does that make sense? It's two different numbers there, four different numbers there, eight different numbers there, 16 different numbers there. The next one will be, probably be, 32. The next one, 64. 128, 256, 512, 1024. Are those numbers familiar to you? Okay. So, speed of line. 
I mean, always, you know, if you go and sell a 64K line, why don't we just sell 50K lines and 100K lines? And it's all got to do with the zeros and ones, all got to do with binary. Okay, so that's why things, speeds are the way they are. Okay, that's why they're strange speeds. So everything ties back into this binary numbering system. When we get to 1024, a lot of the times we just say, well, that's about 1,000. Okay, so the other thing is just a little thing that you don't actually need to know. Kilo equals 1,000. A capital K actually equals 1,024. Okay. I don't know if you knew that. The next thing is after you get a kilo line, you sometimes get a one meg line. What's a meg? A meg is 1,000 kilo. Okay. So meg equals 1,000 kilo. So it equals 1,000. 1,000. The next one that you get is a gig. So when you get a gig, it's a thousand meg. Okay, so these are different speeds. So it's it's just a, like a kilo gram is a thousand grams of something. A kilo meter is a thousand meters. So a meg is a is a million of them. Okay, so it just goes up every time. When you're talking about the small k and the capital k, just by the way, you, you probably don't ever have to know this, but that's how you can distinguish between if it's it's a thousand or a thousand and twenty-four. If you get to the meg and the gig, there's no way of differentiating. A small m is milli. That's much smaller than one. Okay, it's a thousandth of one milligram. Okay, it's one thousandth of a gram. So you can't use big m's and little m's and big g's and little g's. Okay, you need to use big ones. So if you can't tell what it is, one of the ways of telling is if it's a if it's a little if it's a b, generally it works in the thousands. If it's a capital B for bytes. Generally, it's 1,024, just by the way. So if I say to you, I'm sending you a 2 megabyte file, a lot of people will say, well, that's 2,000 kilo, which is 2, 000, 2 million bytes of information. Um, and because it's a byte, you could say that it's 16 million bits, or zeros and ones, 16 million bits. Okay. The reality of that is that because there's a B there, generally it's actually 16 times 1024 times 1024. All of this is just for your own interest in case you... The, the reason, the places you might see this is you might see, you get an email or you see a file and you look at your hard disk size and they say, I'm giving you a 60 gig hard drive. And you look and it says 60 gigs. And then you look at different properties of the hard drive and you see it says 62 thousand megabytes you go oh what I got more than 60 60 gigs okay you didn't because that bytes is actually supposed to be times by one 1024 okay when you sell a client to one meg line it's actually a 1024 K line okay it's not a, a thousand so they get a little bit extra there we've already given them a bit more okay all right so that's why the file sizes look different and hard drive sizes look different and sometimes you get an email it's this big and then when you save it and you save the file it's a different size you go well that's a bit strange you try to put files into a CD and it looks like it won't fit and suddenly it does fit. Like the CD is 740 meg or whatever it is and the file you've got is 741,000 kilo. And you think, well, it's not going to fit and then it does. Okay. That's the reason. Okay. Because there's one or two, four little discrepancy comes in there. What you should start understanding though is a 64 kilobit per second line tells you how many zeros and ones you can get down that line. So now you can say, well, how long will a 2 meg file take me to send? Someone says, oh, the file was 2 megs, took forever. So you can say, all right, 2 meg file, how many zeros and ones is it? It's that many zeros and ones. And I can send 16,000 of them in a second. So how many seconds will it take? So how many minutes will it take? So when you log on from home, you look at that file, you can actually sit there. By the time you've worked it out, it'll probably be there. <laughs> okay. So you can actually work out how fast these things are, how big files are and it starts to make a little bit more sense in terms of a document an image is a 20 kilo image and you go well I don't know what does 20 kilo actually mean it talks about how many zeros and ones are needed to carry that information to reproduce that image in some software okay is this helpful if anyone's bored you need to you can go <laughs> except for it is just here for fun all right, so that's zeros and ones. Does that explain why we use zeros and ones and why we use binary, etc.? So, IS, we've got these connections over here, and we connect internationally via satellite and fiber. What's faster, satellite or fiber? Fiber. Let's have a vote. Who says fiber? Faster. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. Who says satellite? One. Okay, we've got six on one for satellite versus fiber. The one thing I told you is speed of light. None of them are faster. They both travel at the speed of light, excluding a little bit of slowing down in a vacuum argument which I had and the little bouncing in the piece of fiber which I had. They both travel at the speed of light. So why do we think fiber is faster? The reason we think it's faster is because the world looks like that, roughly. There's SA, there's the UK. We've got this fiber connection going to the UK, there or thereabouts. And we've got the satellite connection, which does that. Okay. Both of them travel at the speed of light. The one's a longer journey. Okay. So when we, if you drive to Durban, it takes you five hours. And then you drive to Durban via Cape Town, and it takes you 15, 20 24 hours, it's because it's a longer journey, but you still drove at 120 k's an hour. Okay, it's just a longer journey. Both are the same speed. Is the difference between these two is latency. It's the journey time. So if you go to the UK and back, it'll take you around about 200 milliseconds. That's a small s. Milli means a thousandth of. So it's 0,2 seconds. It'll take you about just under about 20% of a second to get there and back. Okay, at the speed of light. And that's called the latency. Okay, the latency. How much extra time it takes to get there and back. On satellite, latency is what is it? 600, huh? 600. 600 milliseconds. So 600 milliseconds on satellite. So satellite takes a little longer to get there, but they're both traveling at the speed of light. Cool. Easy. Easy to understand. All right. So we're sending zeros and ones up and down these lines. And let's start thinking about what these zeros and ones are all about. The first thing is we talk about we talk about satellite and fiber, and we're saying that they both travel at the speed of light. Okay, so in terms of a road, it means that we've got roads that travel at the sp and cars are traveling at the speed of light or 120 kilometers an hour, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're traveling at a certain speed. Um, what is, the one is satellite and the one's fiber. So what's the difference between those in IT terms? Um, and in or in analogy terms, it just means that the one's built out of concrete, and the one's built out of tar. The one might be a sand road, and you just have to hold on tight to the steering wheel at 120 k's an hour. Um, so you get different mediums, and your dial-up line at home is a piece of copper. Comes through copper. Those zeros and ones that come from your computer are traveling at the speed of light. Okay. So your modem at home, which you say is slower, is, is narrower. The bandwidth is less zeros and ones that can go through there. But they, when they go through, they're going through the speed of light. Okay. So the first thing is the infrastructure that you run on. So we've got Ethernet cables that plug into the back of our computers. That's like copper. Um, so stuff can run along copper. We've got satellite connections, which is radio waves going through the air. Speed of light. It's traveling along the speed of light. That's like a sand road. Um, the fiber connections, it's like a concrete road. Okay. Just in a tunnel if it's down underground. Um, so these are all just road, just piece of grass, sand, whatever that you're traveling cars on top of. What are some of the cars that you ride, drive on those roads? Okay, so well, let me give you protocols. Have, you know, you must have heard of a whole bunch of protocols. You've probably heard of TCP IP. Other than the DD, teamwork, commitment, professionalism, intellectual property. <laughs> have you heard of TCP IP? Does anyone know what it means? Okay. Transmission Connection Protocol slash Internet Protocol. Because I think Transmission Connection Protocol is, or IP is within the TCP stack, which don't worry too much about. It's just this way of connecting. And what TCP IP means in analogy terms, in road terms, for me, I think of vehicles. When I say vehicles, what I mean, I hope I've spelled it right. There's no little spell check on the board. Um, the little red line squeals up. You can right mouse click and correct. Um, so TCP IP, and give me an example of a protocol. Give me an example of something in TCP IP. HTTP. Okay, so you might have heard of HTTP. What does it stand for? Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Okay. Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And it's generally used for browsing. Okay, so when you want to look at a website, use HTTP to connect to it. Early on I was saying, if you've got a road and you can drive out of your road, you could drive to see your friends, you could drive to do whatever you wanted to. There's also, you could drive in a car, 
or you can drive on a bike, etc., etc. So different protocols are different things, different vehicles that will travel on sand, tar, concrete, etc. If you've got a boat, it's not going to travel on a road and it's not a vehicle with wheels. So it's not in that kind of portfolio. Um, in, the, in the past, when we were first, this, first an internet service provider, we had a lot of clients who had some different IBM protocol. And um, that was like a boat. It didn't travel on roads. So we talk about things like we'll encapsulate it in TCPIP, which meant we'll take your boat, we'll put it on a trailer, and we'll get it to the other side and we'll take it off the trailer. Okay? It was hectic. You sit there and the client's talking about blah, 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 and don't worry, we'll encapsulate in TCPIP, we'll decapsulate, blah, blah, blah. And you just sit there thinking, what the hell's going on? All they were saying is, we've got a boat. You know? So you need to say, if some guy talks about a protocol, you say, is that TCPIP, which meant it's got wheels. And if he says, no, it's not, we'll put it on a trailer. If he says, yes, it does, then cool, it will drive on our roads. Okay. It was actually easy to understand, but it sounded hell of a hectic. So for me, HTTP is a delivery van. And I'll tell you why. When you go, HTTP is generally for a website. So what you do, you make an HTTP request, which sounds complex, to a website for the, web, for, the, for the home page or whatever it is. So what's actually happening is you're sending a delivery van to the shop and saying, I want, I want all of that stuff. They put the stuff into the delivery van, the delivery van comes back to you, and it unpacks it onto your computer. Okay. So you've used this HTTP protocol. So why have a protocol? What is protocol all about? Let's think about something else. Let's think about SMTP which is simple mail transfer protocol, which is what we use generally for email. Okay, So think about an email that you want to send somewhere. And think about if you had bought a pizza, okay, or you'd bought, or you'd got some um, generic drugs from the, uh, not hectic drugs, generic pharmaceutical drugs from the, from the pharmacy. The dude's coming around, he's going to bring it to you, most, most likely, he's going to be on a little motorbike and he's going to have a little attachment section at the back. His attachments are his medicine. We think of the attachments in a Word document. It would be pretty inefficient for that guy to bring like a 20-foot truck to deliver your little bag of medicine. Okay? So a better way of doing that is to put it on a motorbike. Same thing. If you want a website, you say to the guy, go fetch that website for me. There's lots of furniture in that website. You can try to get the, the couch on the motorbike. It's just not going to work so well. It's possible, but it's not great. Okay? So we designed different protocols around different types of things that we want to transfer, different bits of information. So design the best way of sending that information. And that's what FTP, SMTP, it's just the best way to pack those zeros and ones so that they get to the other side in the best format. Okay? It also helps later on when you start saying, I want to talk to a web server and it's not, everything's not just generic and you're letting everything in. So you can now look at it and say, okay, I expect it in a motorbike, so I'm building parking bays for motorbikes, so I'm building delivery areas. So it's better for later on when we start giving information back. Okay. okay so does that make sense what HTTP and FTP and all of that stuff is all about? So you get FTP, um, which you might have heard of. HTTPS is HTTP with security in, embedded. And there's a whole bunch of other protocols. Um, so SMTP for me is a motorbike. FT, uh, FTP, that's when you're like pushing a whole big file or bringing a whole big file. So I think of it as kind of a tanker, one of those tanker trucks bringing petrol. Pretty inefficient to bring petrol on the back of a motorbike. Okay, much better to bring in a big, big tanker. Okay, so we've designed different protocols to bring information across in the most efficient way. Okay, so that's a little bit about protocols and so on. Makes sense. Examples of each, uh, yeah. but an FTP, what would typically be an FTP? Would, would it be an application like SAP? Okay. Generally, FTP is used for downloading information. Um, so, it's, so if, for instance, you want to download the la latest Microsoft patches or so on, or the latest software from some website, you could make an FTP connection to that and download it. Another example is in our hosting environment. If you want to build a website, you build it on your computer. Now you've got all these files. You need to save them somewhere else. So you want to save them on a web server. So you make an FTP connection, say, I'm just, I'm, here's my username, here's my password, and I'm pushing these files. The way you do that is you get FTP software. You actually get a piece of software that says, 
when I drag and drop the username and password, I click it and it sends it. And it sends those zeros and ones in the FTP protocol. FTP is a great protocol because it knows how to handle big files. And if it breaks, it knows where to pick up. And it can find the most efficient route and recompile all the zeros and ones on the other side, all the packets and bytes on the other side. Great protocol for sending big files. Um, wouldn't be as good if you sent an email in that, in that way. So um, FTP would be used for something like that. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different protocols. So the voice will work over a different protocol, as an example. Okay. Right. Next. Um, so you want to connect to, you want to send someone an email and you want to browse, etc. Um, but you don't really know how to get. We don't know how these, how the network starts connecting. So let's talk about IP addresses. Okay. So what happens is. There's this IS or Internet Cloud, and should have been in our corporate blue. It has a client's network, and I'll draw a network like that. And there's a user sitting over here on his PC. And the first thing that happens is when you want to talk to the Internet, you need to have an IP address. We've all heard of IP addresses. Do you know how they go? The number, their numbers. So they go from 0 to 255.0 to 255. Dot zero to two five five. Dot zero to two five five. Okay. Does that make sense? What I'm saying there. In other words, the num the first number. So an example would be one nine six. I think it's eight, eight bits will give you 256 numbers. So a byte. That's a byte and a byte and a byte and a byte. So four bytes will give you an IP address. Okay, that's why we start using those numbers. Um, so everything on the internet, when you want to talk to someone, you can't kind of call them by their name. You need to call them by their IP address. So this little guy sitting over here, he gets an IP address, and it might be 196.36.19.2. Four. Let's say that's the dude over there. Okay. Now, on the outside world, there's this website, and let's just call it ABC, or is that too boring? Sex.com. <laughs> um, right, let's just say ABC.com. And that has got an IP address. Let's just call it 9. I'm not going to go through the whole IP address number. When that guy wants to look at a website, he needs to connect to ABC.com. So what he actually does is he takes his browser, and he makes an HTTP connection with the website. So we talk about y'all yeah, making an HTTP connection, FTP, SMTP connection, handshake. We'll do a handshake. All it means is I'm sending this thing off, and I'm saying, here's a delivery van. It's from this IP address four. I'm sending it to nine. Can you pack your website in it? Once it's packed the website in it, it comes back. Okay, that's a whole like handshake. But how did I know that number was nine? I need something to tell me because I can't remember the IP address of everything that I want to go to. So along the way, we've got, no worries, something called DNS. Okay. What does DNS stand for? The main name service. Okay. There's two different things, that, two primary things in DNS server. I think there's about four different things. But anyway, there's two main things that you need. The first is an A reference or your A record. And your A reference tells you about websites. So it says to you, if there's a www.abc.co.za or .com, whatever, that equals 9. In other words, it equals 196.17.3.9. Okay? Gives you an IP address. So what actually happens is this guy says, I want to go to www.abc.com or .co.za. He ends up going to a DNS server. The DNS server says, yeah, that's 9 you need to go to. So he says, okay, I'm going to 9. So he goes, finds routers directing. So the router is like a cop. It's saying, you come this way, you go that way. Um, he's looking after the traffic, making sure there's not too many cars, prioritizing sometimes the cars, all the red cars first, all the blue cars next, all the 
and uh, he'll take all that traffic and send it up the right route. So the D he gets the DNS server and he finds out that it's nine. So now he makes an HTTP connection with nine. Nine knows that he's four and starts sending the information back to four. Okay, makes sense. So you're making your handshake using DNS servers. Same thing happens with email. There's another thing in your DNS server called an MX record. You might have heard of these, you should have. An MX record says that anything at abc.co.za equals seven or whatever the number is. So somewhere over here, the guy's got a mail server. And that IP address for that mail server is seven. Okay. So what happens is you send an email out, send it to joe at abc.com. Your mail makes a DNS query. It says, where's abc.com? He says, yeah, that's seven. Quickly go to seven. So he goes to seven, does a handshake. says, hi, I want to send a mail to joe at abc.com. Mail server on the other side either says, yeah, I'll send it. Or it says, I don't have a joe, whatever it is. And then they start that SMTP handshake and connection, and it starts sending in that information. Okay. In reality, what generally happens is this guy's sitting over here, and there's a mail server on his network too. Mail server. So he connects to that mail server across this, this LAN. He actually gives it to that mail server, and the mail server goes and delivers it to this mail server, and the little user on the other side comes and fetches his mail from that mail server. Okay. So when we get email here, yeah, it doesn't come directly to our inboxes. It goes to the IS exchange environment, and then we make a little connection, get our mail. We're not doing any of the sending on our own computers. The main exchange servers are doing the sending and receiving. Okay. So we get those servers to do it. A server, what does a server look like? Do you know what a, server, a mail server looks like? And a web server, do you know what those two look like? Anyone know? Anyone know? <laughs> they look like that. <laughs> a mail server and a web server and a firewall and uh, anything can all look the same. All it is is a computer running the right software. Okay? So when we give a client a web server or we give them a mail server, with the right software they can all just be one thing. It's just a computer with the right software, mail server software. Okay. Firewall, in theory, can also be the same thing. You can put firewall software on there, and that becomes a firewall. Okay. So all these servers, don't worry about servers. It's a computer running the right thing. You can take a laptop, put the right software on there, put it into the hosting environment, and it will run, provided it's strong enough to handle all the load. Okay. But it's just a server, just a computer with the right software. Okay. So that's how we start doing handshakes, and that's how we use DNS to get us from the one place to the next. Okay, DNS exists in a few places. The first place DNS exists is on your own computer. On your own computer, you've actually got a, you've got a little file called your host file. And sometimes you might have been asked to change your host file. All that's happening there is you're telling your computer, when I type this in, this website in, go to this IP address. Don't ask anybody, just go there. Okay, so a lot of the time that'll be used if you type in intranet. It'll go to our intranet. You think, wow, that was cool. Um, or you want to look at a, you, know, you want to look at it, something that's on your network, and it'll force you to look at that on your network. Okay, so your computer's got a little bit of DNS in it already. Okay, the next place that you'll generally have DNS is on your network. So everyone will run through a DNS server. On, depending on the size of the client, some clients use our DNS server, some use their own. Again, if you type in intranet, the whole world doesn't can't see our intranet, and we don't go connect to some place called intranet or um, what's it called. Uh, no, what's a chill zone? There we go. If you type in chill zone, thanks, man. Get into trouble when marketing sees this. Uh, HR. So now I've been in trouble with both. Um, so you type in chill zone, it goes to a specific place. The whole world doesn't know that chill zone is on our network. We put on our DNS servers as as IS as a company, not as a service provider. It forces us to go there. Okay. So that's the next place, and then IS has got its DNS servers, and then bigger service providers upstream have got. DNS servers. And so a lot of the time we talk about um, it'll take eight hours for your DNS to propagate. We tell clients that on the phone, like, we'll change your, yeah, we'll register, change your MX record. It's going to take eight hours to propagate. What that means is that our, we put it on our server, but our server needs to tell the other server, hey, listen, there's been a changer. And that needs to filter back down to this DNS server there. There's a lot of filtering down. The guys correspond with each other every now and then, start copying information. I always use this, so let me make a copy of that DNS entry. Okay. That's why it's filtering throughout. We can change on our server quickly, but not everyone will see that change immediately. Okay. So that's what DNS, etc., is based on and what it's for. Okay, makes sense.
Okay, so next thing we'll talk about is caching. Um, you might have heard about caching, There's lots of caching. IS does a lot of caching. So if we again look at the IS network, what happens is all of our clients are connecting to us and we sell two different pieces of, when we're selling internet access as an example, we sometimes sell a client like a 128 slash 64K, we always forget the abbreviation but it's bits per second line. Sometimes sell them a line like that. What does that mean? It's talking about local and international bandwidth. In other words, we put 128 lanes into IS, no problem. It goes across, there's a peering point that you can use, there's other ISPs that you can get connected to. But if you try to go on our international links, which cost us more money, we're only going to let you use 64 lanes at a time. Okay, so there's still 128 lanes from the office to us, and there's still 128 lanes to that peering point and all over. But if you try to go overseas, there's only 64 that you can use. Okay. That's what, a, that's what that line means. So sometimes you don't add them together, and that's not the size of the line. If a client serves everything 128K and then one guy tries to go international, he's not going to get 64 suddenly because he's going to fight with the rest of the guys for that 128. That's the first bit. Once he's got to our network, he's got it, but he hasn't been able to get to our network fast enough. Okay. So that's why we, so we break down into two different line sizes, okay? local and international. And the reason we do that is because it's very expensive. Our international bands are very, very expensive, hence we charge our clients for it. So if we can give them only a bit of what they need, we can deploy a little bit less, and they can, we could all save money. Okay. Another cool thing that we do is caching. And when people do go overseas, a lot of the time they're looking at the same information time and time again. So on our international bandwidth, just before people go out, we put a big cache server down. A cache server is a server that looks at the most commonly requested information, makes a copy of it, keeps it, and the next dude that asks for it just gives him a copy instead of going and fetching all the way from Microsoft again. It's the same the last guy just asked me for that. I'm going to give it to you here. So we save huge, huge, huge bandwidth on our cache service in IS. can't remember the stats exactly, but it's in the region of 100 megabits per second. Okay. Somewhere around there. Caches are very clever in terms of their technology. So they might uh, uh, decide some pages, web pages might have a timeout for the cache so it knows it can't keep it for longer than that. Um, it will, might do a quick check to see that the file has, size hasn't changed or the date hasn't changed. It will dynamically say, well, this has been too old or I've had lots of requests for this, so let me go fetch it again. So different caches have different kind of thinking in it. But the, it's up to that cache server to decide how it actually works. Okay. So cache is all about storing this information so that you can resend that information. The first place any of us ever see cache is on our own computer. You know when you're connected at home, dialing up, things are super fast. Click the back button and that page comes up fast because the information is already on your computer. Okay? Already on your computer, i.e. it was cached. It was cached on your computer. So your PC over here has got its own cache inside it. Okay. Not on the screen. Inside. Not on top, it's inside. So your computer's got its own cache in there, and that's where you clear your history and all of that. All those files are sitting in there. Um, the next place that you might have a cache server is on, your, on the actual network as a client. You might have your own cache server there. The next place would be up at IS, where we send all of our clients through the cache. Okay. Saves us huge bandwidth, obviously. Saves our clients too, because they save on what? How do they save? They save on latency. Okay, they get it from our service. Get it from here, you don't have to worry about the latency internationally. Okay. We don't currently, as far as I'm aware, put any cache servers locally. We don't cache any local information. In other words, there's nothing between peering points and on other ISPs. We've got the largest hosting environments in the country, so no need to cache our own hosting stuff because it's going down our own network. It's right there. You know, come swap across to there. Okay. So this network of ISs in Rosebank as an example, we work on a gigabit a gig network. People say, yeah, it's a gig network. And our hosting environment is running on a gig. So what is a gig? The rest of the abbreviation, gigabits per second. Okay, Gigabit per second, that means how many zeros and ones can go through that one second. We've got a hosting environment next to that. And in that hosting environment, we run a gigabit per second network. And between the two, we've got a switch. And it's a gigabit per second switch. So what that means is that here's a highway that you can have a, a, mil, a thousand million cars on the highway, a million million cars, whatever it is, million million cars on the highway, and um, a thousand million, yeah, a thousand million cars on the highway, 
There's another highway that can, has got a thousand million lanes, or it's a thousand million lanes, the other one's got a thousand million lanes. In the middle of the two, we've got an intersection. But that intersection's got a thousand million lanes. Okay. So what happens is you're driving along, you go through the intersection, and you're on. It should make no difference. So you're driving along the N3, it's three lanes, goes branches off to Pretoria and branches off everywhere, you get onto the N1, it's three lanes, so you just drove straight on. Okay. It shouldn't slow you down. Okay. And it's right there, so there's no latency. So cash-wise, for this guy who comes up here, if he wants to look at something in the hosting, it takes the speed of light from there to there to get it until it starts coming back. Pretty fast. Okay, it's like 50 meters. Okay, so we don't have to cache it, essentially. All right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about networks and speeds and switches. When you talk about the speed of a switch and it's a gigabit switch or it's a meg switch, that's how many zeros and ones it can transfer through that thing. Okay. It's different. In the hosting scenario, we talk about there's a server over there, and we charge them for the traffic that they send out. And an example is we give them we give them a thousand megs per month. Okay, so we say there you go, you can have a thousand megs, megabytes. What's the rest of the abbreviation there? Traffic? Anyone? Well, you're all technically correct because there is no rest of the abbreviation. It's a thousand megabytes. That's it. So we talk about how many cars you can serve, not how fast we're serving those cars. So we tell them you're on a really fast network, you can serve this many cars, and then we'll start charging you after that. So it's like a toll gate with X number of cars you can go through. Okay, so when you talk about file sizes, um, it's generally, it's not speed anymore. Okay, it's, and generally when you talk about size of, of files and, and data and hard drives, we generally use bytes. When you're talking about speeds, we use bits. Okay, generally. Because a 64 kilobit per second line Sounds more impressive than a 8 kilobyte per second line. <laughs> sounds faster. But a big file, you just wanted to reduce the complexity in it. All right, sounds like you're using less traffic. <laughs> so generally with traffic and things like that, and storage, bytes, speeds, bits in, as a norm. Obviously, you can just convert them. OK, so that's a little bit about our network and how we send out and how our caching helps you. So it helps us saving bandwidth. For all of these guys who make a connection to us, they get the information off this cache server, and the cache only goes gets it once. Okay, saves huge bandwidth for us. Makes sense. Okay, um, from an IP address point of view, you might have heard of dynamic and static IP addresses. You might have heard of that. So what happens is everything needs an IP address. So when you log on, um, one thing you could do is you could have a static IP address. In other words, IS gives you all these IP addresses. It says here's the IP addresses you can connect to the internet. So everyone gets an IP address, and boom, they connect, and everyone in the outside world knows who they are, and you communicate like that. The problem with that is, say for instance, you've been given an IP address, you forget what it is, or you get a new laptop, and you don't know what your IP address was, or people leave the organization, new people come, uh, someone's not there for two months, um, that IP address is wasted. So static IP addresses are fine in some instances, but in some instances you want dynamic IP addresses. And what that means is as you log on, the, comp the network gives you an IP address. So you start talking to the outside world, with this IP address that's allocated to you. That's the difference between dynamic and static IP addresses. Okay. You also get illegal IP addresses. Illegal IP addresses are a specific range of IP addresses that have been permanently reserved that mustn't be used on the internet. Okay. So what's the point of having them? It means that if you get a request from an illegal IP address, you can ignore it. If there's any outside routers in the outside world, just ignore them. What's the benefit of that? The benefit is that if you're an inside organization, you can use those illegal IP addresses without having to get an IP address. You can just start giving people IP addresses so all computers can start talking to each other. They just can't talk to the outside world. Okay. So how do we get them to talk to the outside world? There's a couple of things we can do. We can use something called NATing. You might have heard of NAT. Well, we'll NAT it for you. Don't worry, we'll use NAT to get you outside. Network Address Translation, NAT. So you'll have something over here which will do NATing for you. So what that does is this NAT over here has a whole bunch of IP addresses which the outside world does know, does recognize, does see, and IS is potentially giving them to you. You've got all these ones inside. You don't care. Some are for printers. Some are for people. But when someone tries to get outside, that little device will give you a new IP address for talking to the outside world. So change your communication for the outside world. Network address translates for you. Okay. There's something else that you get called proxying. So you might have heard of proxy. Proxy is a little different to natting. Proxy, does anyone know what the word proxy means in normal English? Like non-IT. Proxy? 
Exactly. You give someone a role to do. So if you live in a townhouse complex and there's a AGM and you have to vote for someone, they sometimes give you a proxy form. If you're not going to be there, sign the proxy for someone else to vote on your behalf. So you're asking someone else to do something for you on your behalf. So you could get a proxy server on the network so that this user connects, says go fetch www.abc.com. The proxy server says, I'll do that for you. Okay. It uses its IP address, it uses its thinking, it makes a connection to the outside world, goes and fetches that for you, brings it back and knows who you are and gives it to you. So it's done it on behalf of you. Okay. Proxying is different to netting. Netting changes your IP address, lets it carry on. Proxying does it on behalf of you. Proxying is also different from caching. Caching says, I've got a copy of it, so I'll give it to you. If I don't have a copy of it, I'll have go get it and then decide if I want to keep it or not. A lot of the time, proxying and caching work really well hand in hand. Because if you think about it, I'm going to go do it for you. I'm going to go fetch that website for you. Here you go, I'm going to deliver it. I'm going to go do it for the next guy. But if I'm doing it for the next guy, if I had just kept that, I could have given him that info if I already had it. So caching and proxying go hand in hand. Often you hear about a cache and proxy server. Those are two different, definite different technical things. Just quite cool that they go together. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. No questions on that. Easy peasy. Can I ask? Yeah, go out. Why is it that you cannot have more of international bandwidth and local? Say, okay. 128 slash 192. Okay. We're, we'd love to sell that, no problem. Think about this. You, you decide that you're going to, um, you need X amounts of international bandwidth. So you build a 128k line. In other words, you build a four lane highway and a four lane back. Out of your building, two IS. So you've got four lanes, you drive to IS, 120 k's an hour, you hit the IS. You go, right, how many lanes you got from you? So we've got six lanes for you. You go, you know, if all four of those ran all the way up, you'd have two lanes spare on the other side. Okay. Plus you can go locally if you want to. So if, if you had six lanes and only four of them were for international, no problem. If you sell someone a 128, 190 slash 192 line, lots of spare bandwidth for them to go internationally. Okay. Cool. What you also get is when we do sell those lines to clients, you get graphs of, of local international so they can see if the one's utilized. Because what might happen is your line's totally uh, like free and it's not very utilized, but you can't browse them internationally. You might find that their international component is saturated. Graphs like that. Yeah. So your international is saturated, but your local is not saturated. There we go. Nice, nice. Makes no sense to me either. And I think they've got in and out chat, which are the wrong way around still, huh? Okay. <laughs> so basically, if you look at a lot of clients' leased lines, because remember it's four, la direction, four lanes in both directions, most, most clients, their lanes coming to them are more utilized than the lanes going out because you bring in information in. Okay. So there's a lot of places where the information can just be replicated and given to you rather than you having to push it out. Because you always think, well, in science, you know, for every action there's an equal opposite reaction. So how can someone be getting more than they're setting out? You go surf a couple of websites, you bring information in, that website's kind of giving that information to you, but not, might not be on a client's network, might be on a service provider network. Okay. So most clients are bringing in more information than they're sending out. If they're sending out more information, you should go and talk to them about hosting, some bulk mailing service, or whatever the problem that they're sending so much information off their network. Okay. Um, so most lines are utilized kind of more that way than they are that way. And that's the case with our, it's a terrible error here. <laughs> and we find that with our international lines as well. If, we go, if we're going internationally, much more downloaded that way than uploaded that way. A little bit better. Okay. What we have done though is all except for one, and that one might not be in existence anymore, of our international lines are bi-directional. Okay, or symmetric, let me say, symmetric. So all lines that we've got are symmetric internationally. There might be one that's not symmetric. I know they're taking it out. But anyway, for all intents and purposes, our, our band is symmetric. So if we have 200 megabits per second, again, I've heard some service provider talk about 400 megabits per second. They add both sides going, you know, both sides up. We talk about it in one direction. So we've got a lot of back bandwidth. Okay, so if we're hosting over here, good for clients overseas because they've got lots of bandwidth to pull that information back on. ADSL line is a different story. ADSL, what does it stand for? Asynchronous. Asymmetric. 
the, exactly. Asymmetric is the key there. It's not symmetric. These 64K lines, 120K lines are symmetric. A dial-up line is generally symmetric, um, but it kind of has hiccups in the transfer there. The, um, the ADSL line is not symmetric. So you get a 1,000, 1024 kilobytes per second coming down, and you've got a 256 going up. 256 kilobits per second going up. Okay, so it's not symmetric. But that's generally cool because generally we're pulling more information than we're sending. Okay, so it's quite a cool service from that point of view. But that's why it's ADSL. Okay, not SDSL. Or just DSL. Okay, so it's not symmetric. Okay. Um, so yeah, that hopefully kind of puts into a little bit of techy stuff. Okay, around speeds. So the difference between set one, set two, set three, and Set two and set three, all of that is basically the roads that we, the tunnels that we built <coughs> under the ground. Okay, so that that'll change every now and then. So the access guys will keep you up to speed. But set two is actually fiber. It's not satellite. Okay, it's just the name for it. It's surface. What is it? Sub African terrestrial connection or whatever it is. I don't know. But it, it's an acronym. But it's actually fiber going under the sea. Okay, so that's just our road. We built a concrete road up to Portugal, wherever it breaks out in Portugal, and our satellite road is, is our actual physical satellite is this highway that we built out of concrete that goes up or rope and goes is up that or, three? No, that's not set three. That's that's a different connection, that's satellite connection. Okay. So there's different names for all of these connections. And the access guys will tell you, they've got a map of it, the plan. You can see what our bandwidth is, what it's called, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, okay, so that's how roughly it works. The last thing I think we're going to go through is I'll just draw for you a quick overview of some of the business units at IS and where they fit onto the network and how they came into existence. Okay, so. Dark. Oh. All right, so. Here's IS. Now we connect to this international internet again. And we connect up to peering point for the local internet. What actually happens across that peering point is we, we all service providers connect into that peering point. But what we've done with um, two different people, Sachs and UUNet, is we said that whole model that I showed you right in the beginning we have a central point, everyone connects to the central point. That's the best thing. Well, we broke that model. And we, what we did was we connected directly with Sykes and directly with the UNET via separate connections. We broke that little thing. We still kept that piece in place, but we also connect directly up to them to increase the speeds of transfer, etc., between each other. Um, the, the peering, we've, you've heard about the peering problems, etc., that we've got. The peering problem is that that connection that we put directly with Sykes at the moment is not big enough. Okay. And I won't go into the kind of legalities around that, but there's, there's arguments around um, increasing that and who should pay, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But it's that problem is that that old way of connecting where you've got a point, and this is IS, that's your unit, and Sykes, all of us connected and a whole bunch of other people connected too. And then what we did was we put direct lines into these guys because they're bigger. Didn't want to put so much road infrastructure in there where we could connect to these guys directly. Okay. So that's one of the issues we've got at the moment. But that's our peering point. In theory, we connect up to the local internet, excluding the IS client base via the peering point. In practice, there is a little bit of direct peering. Okay, direct peering agreements rather than peering point agreements. Okay, and that's I mean, a bit of issue over there. We won't talk about that too much. Okay, so the first and foremost thing that we sell at IS is internet access. Okay. Internet access, as I drew for you earlier, that's what a, a connection is normally a, a br little lightning bolt. Okay, it's not a, like a direct line. What that connection looks like, actually, it, it goes into telecom. So what we do is we put, we've got a router on that side and a router on that side. Routers are drawn like that. We've also got these things called NTUs, little NTU, which is a network termination unit, which is telecom's way of taking that information that they've traveled, traversed along their lines and given it to us in TCP IP format. And because a piece of copper can handle so much information, remember we spoke about lanes and saying if you need more information, make the lane more lanes. What happens if you've got one lane and that lane is already too fast because everyone's traveling the speed of light? 
what you can do, you can't give someone half lane because the car won't go. You can say, that's your bit of time. That's your bit of time. You stop the car. So cars go and then they stop and then they go and they stop. And it breaks in, in the traffic. Okay? So an NTU is, is, um, actually takes little bits of time on that copper. It says, that's your time. That's your time. That's your time. So I can use the same piece of copper over and over again. All right. A little bit kind of complex-ish. But basically... What happens after that is it goes through this telecom network, can go any route, and they've got a whole bunch of different routes, comes out on the other side. So we draw it as a data connection, but the reality of it is that it's a lot less straight line than that. Okay, goes through a whole network. Same thing for the IS network. If you send an email from here to someone in Cape Town, it doesn't necessarily go from Bryanston to Cape Town. In fact, it'll go from Bryanston to Rosebank, if the Cape Town lines down, it might go to Durban, and then from Durban to Cape Town, it'll follow the best route. Okay. Same thing in the telecom network. It looks a little more like that. Probably a good reflection of it. Um, and then it comes out on the other side. Okay. Um, so we just draw it to make it simple as a data connection, a little lightning bolt. Okay. And what Network termination unit. Unit. Um, in the past, there used to be these little boxes that we used to have all over Rosebank in our network room. They were just boxes kind of everywhere connecting or little time slots and little green lights flashing if it was a 64 or one, it's flashing if it's a 128, it's flashing the speeds. Nowadays, we get like a card. And in fact, I have been there for years, so it might have even changed. Get a little card, and that can terminate 10 um, different clients' lines, and you get bigger cards and so on. So in the past, they looked like that, and there's an actual physical piece of copper going to the one point and then had these NTUs. Nowadays, it's a lot slicker. You can have fiber going into a cabinet. It's got a whole bunch of things. There. Okay. Those cash, uh, rose banks are a really good place to go and have a look at some of these things. You can see NTUs. You'll see um, fiber connectivity from telecom because we talk about connecting directly internationally like it comes into our building. But the reality is it lands on some satellite stations, uh, telecom satellite stations. Then they bring it through to like, their offices in Rosebank. And from their offices in Rosebank to our office in Rosebank, we've got two separate fiber rings. The one goes down kind of under the ground and comes up into the bottom of the building. The one goes, comes from the other side into the top of the server room. So we've got them coming in different places in the server room in, in, uh, in Rosebank. So it's not like there's no satellites on our building. Similarly, there's no, um, there's no kind of piece of wire that comes in. We've got fiber ring, they call it. It's a different piece of fiber coming into the IS building. So that actually exists. Kind of, you can actually see it coming in. Um, this, uh, this satellite station is in, what's it called? Crowthorn, near the Crowthorn Shopping Center. Just, you don't, <laughs> don't, don't point. That's north. <laughs> okay, so uh, a little bit, it's like 20 k's down the road, down Main Road. If you just follow down Main Road, you'll find Crowthorn, uh, hit a T-junction, hit a left. There's a whole bunch of satellites behind the spa and spur there. One of those was at one stage dedicated to us. So the satellite lands there and then we bring it via telecoms lines. So it's a little more complex than just a kind of a line going in. Um, also in Bryanston, you'll see things like our, our uh, cache servers, massive servers, three or four of them, big hard disk space, little displays in them saying how many megabits per second they're actually serving out, how much they're caching. Um, I think it gives you kind of pages served out or megabits per second served out. And obviously for me, the, the nicest one is megabits because you can actually tell how much info is being served out. It's nice to go and see those things. Okay. So even from, for us, when I draw that cloud, getting from here to uh, Rosebank's a whole diff bunch of different routes via telecom links, etc. So the first business that we've set up and got running is access. So it's internet access at its rawest. There's a lot of other uh, features and stuff, and I don't want to offend the guys by saying it's internet access, but it's it's in its raw form. The, the fundamental of it is internet access. They've got things like. Um, uh, 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 that's, that's rude. Um, they've got things like their bandwidth management tools, so they can manage your bandwidth. You can say this much SMTP, this much FTP, this much for this division. These IP addresses have got this percentage of our bandwidth. They've got a whole bunch of other services, not just um, internet access, but that's in its essence what we set it up for. Um, <laughs> thanks. That's my internet access uh, summary. Um, we then got. Our VPN division. Now, VPN, if you don't know what a VPN is, it stands for Virtual Private Network. Okay. What that means is IS has got all these branches. So we might have a Cape Town branch, Durban branch, P 
PE branch. And what will happen is a client, if they've got a branch in Cape Town and a branch in Joburg, they could buy this long line from Telcom. Or what they could do is take their branch, connect it into IS in Cape Town, take their branch and connect it us in Rosebank, and maybe in Durban, take your branch and connect it. Now, those three branches all have little lines just into IS. And then across the IS network, we let them talk to each other. Okay. So if our links between Cape Town and, and Joburg go down, there might be a redundant link to Durban. So their traffic will still go through. So they won't necessarily see it. So virtual private network, it's a private network, they think, but it's actually public. It's our network. So it looks like it's private. Now, we've got two different virtual private networks. We've got an MPLS network and a switch network but we hardly ever sell the switched. And to give you an idea, what does it actually mean? It means that if you built this massive highway and you wanted to say to people, don't worry, we'll make sure your, car, your cars are looked after, there's a couple of different ways you could do that. One, you could say, this lane is always reserved for you. Okay, that's one way. If this lane breaks, we'll reach you this lane, this lane will become yours. We'll give you quality of service. If this lane breaks, you're the first most important person to use that other road and we'll take that other guy off the road and put you on. So you get quality of service with platinum, gold, and silver. We'll put you on there first, second, third. We'll guarantee you this much downtime, latencies, etc. We'll guarantee you this little downtime. We shouldn't talk about this much downtime. Guarantee you no, no more than this much. Um, so we can guarantee things based on the lanes. We could also color, color, the, color code the cars. We could say all, all the stuff that comes up from your network, we could put a little blue sticker on, then we know it's your car. No one else can look at your car. No one else can steal your car. On the other side, we know it's a blue car, so we give the blue sticker, all the blue stickered cars to you. Okay? We'll put a little gold sticker next to it so we know that it's your company and it's gold type service. So if a car comes to us and it's got a platinum sticker, we'll let him go before your gold sticker, but we still know that the red sticker is for his company, the blue sticker is for yours. Okay, so there's different ways of looking after your roads and your vehicles on the roads. In, on the way to Joburg, you'll see some of the lanes have got those little cones in the road so the bus can drive along during the day. So we talk about bursting. You can burst, which means that that's your lane. You can use it, but if no one's using the lane next to you and you need a little bit more, you can use both lanes. But if you're not using it, some other guy might burst into your lane. If both of you are there, we'll quickly stop the bursting and you'll both use your lanes. So that's what bursting is all about. It's not complex. You just take the other guy's lane for a little bit of time until he needs it then you get off his lane. So a VPN is all about giving the guys their, like looking after their cars in a certain way prescribed by what they've paid for, making sure no one else gets their cars. Information only goes to them if it's their cars. All right. So that's what a VPN is all about. We're connecting multiple branches. It makes you look like you're connected like that between the branches. Okay, when you're actually connecting via the IS network. It's great because if one of these lines goes down, it's our problem. We look after the whole network. If that line went down for you, you don't have connections, you need to tel talk to telecom, etc. Okay. So that's what the, that's what a VPN is all about in its rawest form. So that's our VPN business. Okay, makes sense. Our hosting business, I spoke a little bit about it earlier, is this IS network, and right next to that is this hosting network. Okay. And it's connected, obviously, very, at very high speeds. It's a high-speed network. The IS is a high-speed network. Connect them together at high speeds. So it looks like it's the IS network. So the first thing is we separated because I was talking about this fiber that comes in and these cache servers and DNS servers. We've got, we have like three or four DNS servers. We used to have them. I don't know what they're called now, but they used to be called Hermes and Apollo, and uh, I think it's Herm was and Apollo isn't. So I don't know about that. But you'll actually see Herm, Hermes was one of, if you do like a lookup of someone's domain, you might see that their domain is looked after by Hermes or Apollo, and then you know it's like an IS, it's on our IS DNS servers. So you've got lots of servers in this environment and lots of stuff happening in here. In a hosting environment, it's your computer. You want to come to it, you want to see it, you want to work on it, etc. Not a good place to put into that network room. So we built a separate network room, connected the two up. That's the only reason they're physically separated. Logically, they're very, there's very little separation from a logic point of view because it's big highways joined together. Now, hosting was all about, originally, we used to build websites at IS. And one of the clients said to us, well, if you put it on my network, it's down my driveway. If my driveway falls, in other words, if there's a big rainfall and no one can drive down my driveway, they can't see my website anymore. Can't you put it on your side? So we started putting websites on our side. We built a hosting environment. It started with websites, but it's not about websites anymore. It's about applications in our environment. So it could be your mail service, it could be web service, it could be your ordering system, it could be your online banking, applications in that environment. Okay. And that's where hosting really started from. 
whole bunch of servers in that environment. They've got back, and they've got much more than just putting your server in our environment. They talk about obviously the right environment, the right speeds, doing backups, doing firewalling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. The next area we'll talk about is Brett's area: security. Security is all about this information that these zeros and ones that are traveling down. What are these zeros and ones doing, and how can we make sure that they're not doing destructive things um, to a client's network? It's all about trying to stop intentional attacks on a client's network or intentional um, theft or any of that type of thing, misuse of networks. So we put in place security devices that will actually look after, in, in your hosting environment, you might have a server there, you might put some firewalls in front of that server. Firewalls normally represent by a little triangle. On your network, if that's your network, you put a little firewall in front of your network. So what a firewall is, it's a security guard in its, in its rawest form. It's a security guard, and I always think of a security guard, and he's got a set of rules. He says, if a guy comes in with a delivery van, ask him where he's going to, and if he's going to um, the Europa shop or the canteen, delivery van's cool. If he says he's going to kind of uh, see someone in a building, you go, why are you in a delivery van? Okay, so don't let him in. If a guy comes on his motorbike, and he says he's going to see the the diesel section. You go well. That you can't go there. You know. If he comes in in a big truck and he says I'm delivering diesel, so that's fine. Diesel and he's going to the diesel place. That's fine. So he looks at the protocol. Where you're coming from. He might say we only let diesel in if it's got a Caltech sticker on or a Shell sticker. But now I'll offend some clients. <laughs> so look at where that's coming from, where it's going to, and what it's doing as a security guard. So in firewalling terms, you say. Request comes through, little SMTP handshake that's trying to happen. He goes, I'm trying to do SMTP to this IP address and I'm from this IP address. Firewall looks, says that's cool or that's not cool. If, for instance, I'm trying to do an SMTP handshake to a web server, which is not a mail server, I'm going to can it. At the same time, I'm going to write it down. So I keep a log of all of this as well. That's what a firewall is, basically. If I try to um, do an FTP connection to an FTP server on your network, but I'm from an IP address that I didn't expect, so from someone else to go, ah, I've only got a few guys who are FTPing to the server, so I'm not going to let you in. Okay, so security does, at its raw, some firewalling, and that's what a firewall is in, in essence. Um, it's a security guard. Then security also has other, a couple of other things, those caching and proxying that you can do. Um, we can take care of some of those, and I'll talk to you about their products. Um, it also does content management, so it looks at those zeros and ones that are coming down and says, yeah, I'm delivering diesel, so it has a look and says, oh, it smells like diesel, looks like diesel, you know, off it goes. So it can do some of that around security as well. Okay. So it looks after things that are going onto our client's network, things that are coming off of our client's network. Okay. Um, there's a mobility division, and mobility is all about how you get onto our network in a mobile way. So the first thing is dial-up. You can get onto our, way, onto our network by dialing. IS has got those couple of branches, but we've also got POPs around the country. POPs are points of presence around the country. So you could dial up to a point of presence and get internet access from that point of presence. The whole methodology and how that goes, I don't think we've got time for now. It's kind of the right routers and how you get assigned an IP address and where you get authenticated from some other time. Or the dial guys, the mobility guys can take you through that. But there's two general flavors from a dial-up point of view. The one is you might be wanting to dial up to your company network. So when we're at home and we want to work at home, you dial up and then you're on the network. It's as if you're on the network. There's some security magic and you're on the network. Okay? Clients who want to do that, they don't necessarily want to have dial-up modems at their offices so that you dial up. They'd rather say, okay, well, let the guy dial up to ICE and then bring him back down that least line that I've got with you guys and let him think he's on the network that way. Okay, that's, um, what's it called now? Secure dial. Well, it used to be called VRAS, so I'm not sure what it's called now, but you get onto, it's a virtual RAS service. RAS is remote access service. So in the past, you dial up to your, your own network, now you dial to IS network and we'll push you down there. The other thing we've got is VISP, which is virtual ISP service. So we used to sell all these dial up accounts to thousands and thousands of people. We used to have the brand Icon, which is a really strong brand in the market, but we stopped selling it directly. We started setting up points of presence and let other people resell our service. So we we'll set you up as an ISP, call you, call you an ISP, you're a virtual ISP, you tell people what your phone number is, but it's IS's phone number, you give them all your points of presence, it's our points of presence, and we let them connect to the internet via our connectivity, but we just charge you for it. Okay, and you can charge all those little individual use virtual ISP service. And then Richard will take you through some of the other mobility things around how you get connected via 
wireless connectivity, um, et cetera, et cetera. A whole bunch of different ways of getting connected. Getting your mobile phones um, connected for email. If you've got uh, email on your network and you wanted to, to get it remotely. Okay, so that's mobility. The next one, I'm from Application Solutions and we're all about taking a lot of what we've learned in the security space and the hosting space and taking what is everyone asking for from an application point of view. Let's put that application in our environment instead of them building it by themselves, buying servers and building it and deploying it, we'll do it in our environment and they just pay for however much they use it. So a good example is email. Instead of buying a mail server, put it on your network and looking after that mail, we'll put the mail in our environment and you just pay for however many users you want on that mail server. Okay, so we, we take commonly used applications, put them into our environment, manage it for the client, they don't need to look after it, and we just charge them for however much they use it. Okay? We've got an Africa business unit. An Africa business unit says, if you want to start using these VPNs and connectivity, but you've got branches throughout Africa, and they need to connect to you via VPN or via internet access, we can connect them to the IS network. So we're basically building points of presence through Africa and getting people connected to the IS network through Africa. Okay, fairly simple to understand. And then we've got voice, voice division. It's all about saying we're allowed to talk on a phone which is converted from phone to, no, uh, to zeros and ones across the network. The zeros and ones go to the closest point and they become voice again. Okay, that either happens through um, all the way digitally, doesn't leave a computer, um, it just stays on the network and computers or it might go to the closest point and then break out into a telephone network and ring on someone's phone. Okay, so voice is all about making sure that we can use zeros and ones on our network to talk. Okay. Um, and then we've got a couple of vertical industries which look at vertical areas of eyes and say, let's get a couple of those solutions together plus what the vertical is asking for. Let's build a new solution if we have to. Um, and build, build that. And that's the business units at IS. That's what we all do. So we build and support these solutions. Clearly sales sell them. Operations make sure that they're running all the time and all the other divisions are there generally to support us as staff. Okay, HR, marketing, obviously internal, external support sales as well. Um, legal, admin, billing our clients. Okay, that's in a nutshell what IS is all about. Cool, happy. Anything you want to know? That makes sense. Easy stuff. Because the main, the main lesson around this today is that you might hear things every day that don't make sense to you. Ask about them. You know what zeros and ones are all about. You know what bits and bytes are all about. You know a little bit about protocols, caching, DNS, FTP. You've heard a couple of things. And these things shouldn't be too complex after today. So what it means is that you're going to hear about something else which I haven't spoken about and you're going to go, I don't know how that works. Either think about it going back to some of the fundamentals, or write it down and go and ask someone. And ask them for an English explanation. These things aren't hard. A lot of the time people just confuse you. I think they want to keep their jobs or something in IT. It's not hard stuff. Just uh, find out, get an, an analogy for it, and work out how it actually works. It won't confuse you. So don't be scared. If you see stuff in proposals you don't understand, go and ask. If you get a client who says something you don't understand, don't make it up. Write it down and say, oh, I don't know what you mean. I'll find out what you mean. Um, it's not hard stuff. Don't be scared of this technology. It's actually not hard stuff. Okay. Is anyone still feeling totally in the dark? Okay. We're feeling good. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks. Cool, man.